If you are a movie junkie like me, you've probably noticed that most movie reviews are basically plot summaries with zero or very little editorial perspectives based on any moral standards. Now, it's not very often that you come across a book that gives up Christian perspectives on blockbuster films in a way that ties together the connection between faith and film as this book does. A Catholic Goes to the Movies by Brazilian father and theologian, a movie critic, Father Daniel Callum. And on today's Catholic Focus, Father Callum joins us not only to talk about his book, but also to talk about some of the underlying Christian themes that can be found in some of the more popular films of the day. So be sure to stay tuned. Welcome, Father Callum, to the set of Catholic Focus. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I had a chance to read this book in its entirety, and it's a fantastic read. So congratulations on this book. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask you, though, what brought about the idea to bring this thing together? It's almost by accident, really. A friend of mine edits the Chesterton Review. Okay. In every issue, twice a year, they have a film review. About 10 years ago, he found himself short of a review, so he asked me to fill in. Just out of the blue? Out of the blue. Okay. And I wrote a long review on magic, uh, prestige, uh -huh. of Ingmar, Ber Ingmar, Ingmar Bergman film from 1958. Yes. Anyway, I began writing. In over 10 years, I got enough to publish in a book. Oh, good. So they're really a haphazard collection of what I happened to have seen the day before the deadline. <laughs> oh, I see. How was it organized? Because you seem to group it in almost sort of themes. No, no, it's completely haphazard, what okay. I happen to see. Any union, any unity in the book comes from the fact that my approach is different from the standard, as you in indicated in your introduction. I tend to look at things from a theological point of view. Yes. I'm not interested in the actors, hardly in the directors. Yes. What I want to see is what is the, the world view behind this film? What are they implying? What do they tell us about society today? Okay. What are the theological as well as the philosophical and social implications? Okay, was this not a, a summary of what happened? It was, no, more, certainly it was not. more of an in-depth, almost reflection, if I may say so, uh, of your personal uh, beliefs in this book. That's right. Okay. I often use the film as a jumping off point for a little essay on some important thing, the problem of evil, okay. uh, justice, uh, even the notion of a fairy tale, for example. Yes. Uh, how these things are, these perennial themes come up in movies. Today. Yeah. And also, I think that the, the, the movie is our folklore, and therefore it's going to draw upon the ancient themes of yes. growing up, of maturity, of responsibility, of virtue, of vice, virtue rewarded, vice punished, that sort of thing. Yes. I was very happy when I was reading the book that you covered four of my favorite films. Oh. All right. And if it's okay, I'd like to maybe go into that. Sure. And the first film I would like to talk about is the controversial 2014 film called Calvary. Hmm. So to put that into perspective, let's, let's have a quick look at the, uh, the trailer now. I'm here to listen to whatever you have to say. I'm going to kill you, Father. Certainly a startling opening line. I was raped by a priest when I was seven years old. Why don't you make a formal complaint? What good would it do? The man's dead. Things you hear in confessions these days. The mess people make of their lives. You're a very nice looking young woman. This is my daughter Fiona. But you're a priest. I was married before I became a priest. You can do that, can you? It would appear so. There's no point in killing a bad priest, but killing a good one. That'd be a shock. Could have a word. I hope we don't get locked in here. We'll have to make love to keep warm. We have to ask ourselves, what does this man want? He wants to be loved. He wants to be admired. What do you see when you look at me? You see a sophisticated, eminent man in the prime of his life. He wants to be feared. Is this a police matter? No, it's a personal thing. What did you say you wanted a firefighter? I didn't say. Your church is on fire. It takes a lot of nerve to burn down a church. Well, this is a personal angle. Nobody will have a grudge against your father, no? I'm going to kill you because you're innocent. Not right now, though. I'll give you enough time to put your house in order. The time is gone, you don't even realise it. My time will never be gone. So you're sure there's a God? 
not that father yet. Well, the future he known. Do you need help? I have had murderous feelings, I have to admit. Referring to the commandment, thou shalt not kill. What about self-defense? It's a tricky one, all right. Run along now, father. Your sermon is finished. He needs taking down a pig or two. That's what he needs. Take me down, then. Venom wasted. Wow, what a film. Father, if this is a social commentary about the church in Ireland at the moment, we are in big trouble. What, what sort of themes can you see coming from this film? I think the key to the film is the fact that the old priest wears a cassock. Yes. Nobody, no priest wears cassocks anymore. anymore. You're right. A lot of them don't wear Roman collars. Yes. In fact, one of the characters says, why do you wear that cassock? He doesn't receive an answer. But I think the, the symbolism is obvious. What Father James represents in the film is the old Catholic Church. Correct. The church that formed Irish culture. And, and at its best was a, a means of spiritual uh, a consolation, spiritual maturity. Yes. And throughout the film, Father James is that presence. He brings people what they need. He, he's a mature man. He was married before he became a priest. He has a daughter with a wonderful reconciliation scene, and he's not flabbergasted, he's not uh, flummoxed by any of the challenges, the sex abuse, the greed of the church, the superficiality. He, he's able, as a mature man, to confront each person with his moral state until four events shake his confidence completely. His spirit is broken, and he actually leaves. He's on his way to abandon the town and presumably the priesthood. Yes. But he meets a woman and given the nature of the film, Calvary, mm -hmm. he's obviously a Christ figure of some sort. Yes. This could be his Gethsemane. Yes. The, the torture, mm -hmm. the, the torture, the, the, the grief that he experiences when he can't face anymore the difficulties of his vocation. Mm -hmm. And he meets a woman, and they have a conversation earlier about faith and the profundity of faith and the ability of faith to endure, to, to last through the most... Uh, uh, terrible challenges. Situations, yes. And therefore, he goes back, having met this angel, as it were, to console him. Okay, so let's move on to the next film. What I like to talk about is one of my all-time favorites, and we're going to show the trailer right now, and it absolutely needs no introduction. It is the 2008 Christopher Nolan film, The Dark Knight. Let's have a look at the trailer. pockets with knives and lint. Evening, Commissioner. Why so serious? Where is he? People are dying. What would you have me do? Endure. You can be the outcast. You can make the choice that no one else will face right choice. Gotham needs you. A little fight in you. I like that. Then you're gonna love me. Now that's more like it, Mr. Wayne. <laughs> it's all part of the plan. Come on, hit me! Wow, I, I don't know what to say. I'm, I've been a huge fan of Batman since I was a kid. Now, I have to say though, interestingly, in your book, you note that the 
Dark Knight illustrates the point that there is an unsettling aspect of our culture, that evil has expanded to fill the vacuum formed by men who have abandoned the faith in God. What do you mean by that? That's really profound. You have to contrast the central movie in the trilogy. Okay. Batman Begins and The Dark Knight Rises at each end represent a, a, a threat by something called the League of Shadows. Yes. And they want to bring down Gotham because it's corrupt, a sort of Sodom and Gomorrah theme. But the central film, The Dark Knight, there you have uh, an evil character who is evil for the sake of evil. The Joker. Yeah, the Joker, right. Mm -hmm. And as Chesterton said, there's a feeling deep down in us that if you really want something done, you go to the dark powers. <laughs> and he represents that. It's, it's evil incarnate. He has no purpose aside from destruction, destruction and right, and, mayhem. and compromise. And yeah. Money means nothing to him. Yeah. And he's also a man of what you might call preternatural powers. He's continually performing feats that seem utterly astounding on his own. Yeah. It, it really is... I say beyond, beyond the normal. It's almost supernatural. And he's always trying to make people do something bad, something evil. Okay. For this, to show that, as it were, the, the veneer of virtue or even civilization is very, very thin. Yes. And when people are in a corner, they will resort to savagery. It, it's, it's a ferociously evil character. Yes. And it really is Satan personified, I think. Our society has given up on the devil. But this movie makes us think twice about that. And at the very final scene, Batman has the chance to kill the Joker, to let him drop to his death. And he won't do but it. he doesn't. Yeah. And the Joker ridicules him for his virtue. But that picks up a theme from the first movie. I don't know if you recall it or not. Uh, Batman begins when he goes to the League of Shadows to learn his martial arts. Yes. He's asked to, to execute a prisoner, yes. to kill a man, in other yes. words. And he won't do it. And they ridicule him for that because the whole point of the League of Shadows is to take God's power of vengeance, as it were. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Take that power of vengeance and to exercise it by humans. But he won't do it. And he tries to destroy them, as it were, if you remember. <laughs> yes. What, so, a fan, what a fantastic film. I really like that one. Nolan's, uh, Nolan has a, a tremendous power of, I think, of cinematography. Now, it's very interesting that you bring that perspective uh, you know, with your theological background into that movie. Never really thought of it that way as the Joker, as a devil incarnate in that respect. So yes. thank you for that. You know what? Let's move on to the next one. This one that I'm a little uh, surprised, I'll be to say, to, 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 to have read uh, in your book. And this one is The Last Days of Disco. You know, this is the 1998 film by uh, the Whit, Whit Stillman. But uh, let's have a look at this trailer to set the tone, shall we? <laughs> This country was a dancing wasteland. You know the Woodstock generation of the 1960s that were so full of themselves and conceited? None of those people could dance. I don't care. I don't want that element in the club. Okay, I work in advertising. Is that a crime? What's happening in this country? I have a very bad feeling about the clubs. It's like a meteorite is headed straight for it. It's going to destroy everything. Yeah, well, I don't think it'll be a meteorite. something deeply ingrained in human biology. Women prefer bad over weak and indecisive and unemployed. I don't know about that. You think they do prefer weak, indecisive and unemployed? What if in a few years we don't marry some corporate lawyer? What if we marry some meatball like you? I just think it's so important to be in control of your own destiny. Late at night, you find yourself with some awful guy with disgusting breath thrusting his belly up against you, trying to stick a slobbering tongue in your mouth. Ugh. Thank God this is a whole new era in music and social models. We're in complete control. There are a lot of choices out there. I have to admit, I'm surprised. Uh, when I watched the film, I, I just saw it as a coming of age, you know, kind of film. But you do some, you, you, you actually put it interestingly in chapter 20 of your book under the title, Three Christian Films, all right? Um, and you call it an allegory in, tra in the tradition of Pilgrim's Progress, that famous 1678 uh, piece of religious literature. How do you see this as a Christian film? Well, I know Whit Stillman. I've met him. 
And okay. I send him my reviews, and he, he's very complimentary. Okay. So I think I have something going for myself. And <laughs> <laughs> I see it really as an allegory of, of, uh, of the history of salvation. You have to see the disco okay. as the Temple of Jerusalem. Okay, yes. And only the elect are admitted. Only the Jews could go into the temple. There's a, a, a doorman who allows certain people to enter, yes. only the favored. Yes. And they go in, and it's a wonderful moment, conversation, dancing, Party, all the, yes, yeah, the, yeah. the... It represents, as it were, the joys of, of, of God's favor. Yes. There are two female characters, Charlotte and Alice. Yes. Alice represents the Old Testament, okay. and Charlotte represents the Gentile nations. Uh -huh. And the Jews were accused of committing adultery with the Gentile nations because of, of idolatry. Yes. And Charlotte convinces Alice to have an affair. So, yes. She's corrupted. And then later on in the film, a man called Josh appears. Josh is the Jewish form of Jesus. Yes. Joshua, Jesus. Okay. Actually, at one point, he goes through a locked door, as Jesus did. Yes. He kicks it open. <laughs> and the guy looks up and says, Christ. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? <laughs> it's almost uh, symbolic in yeah. a way. And okay. the disco, they're, they're, it's their money, their money, the laundering money, uh -huh. cleansing of the temple. The DA comes in and cleans the place out. Josh represents Christ, and he rescues Alice. And disco, therefore, represents the Old Testament dispensation coming into the new. And at the end of the film, towards the end of the film, disco is dead. Yes. Disco's over. The disco is closed. But Josh says, disco's too good ever to be lost. It was wonderful. And he and Alice bring disco into the world. It's the gospel going into the, into the world. And the very last scene, Love Train, is the disco song we song, hear. Song, yes. And they're on the train, and they start doing disco, and everybody in the train joins in. Symbolic of the gospel. The Old Testament dispensation okay. renewed in the New Testament dispensation, yes. going out into the world. And then all the people on the plat platform start discoing. Yes. So it's the gospel it's moving out. It's permeating out into the world. Okay, I can see that. And when Josh gives his, he's always preaching. It's a very Protestant film in that sense. Uh -huh. Jesus is Protestant through and through. When, when he's preaching at the end about disco's too good to be lost, it must be preserved. Yes. Church bells are ringing in the background. Uh -huh. And he's going off to the Messianic banquet with Alice, but we never see it. You never, yes. Because in Protestant theology, we don't have the Messianic banquet in the Eucharist, as yes. we do. It's just assumed in the movie. Well, it's going to be in the future, in heaven. And the last film, Father, I'd like to talk about is the 2006 Prestige. Let's have a look at the trailer, shall we? I'll perform this feat in a manner never before seen by yourselves or any other audience anywhere in the world. The audience loved it. This trick is top notch. We need to celebrate. <laughs> a real magician tries to invent something new. God. It's something that other magicians will scratch their heads over. I suppose you have such a trick. Yes, you do. It's the one they're going to remember me for. What happened? It was the greatest magic trick I've ever seen. I need to know how he does it. He has no trick. It's real. Every great magic trick consists of three acts. The first act is called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary. But of course, it probably isn't. The second act is called the turn. He's obsessed with discovering your method. The magician makes this ordinary something do something extraordinary. Huh. Now you're looking for the secret but you won't find it. That's why there's a third act called The Prestige. This is the part with the twists and turns, where lives hang in the balance. Julie, come on! And you see something shocking you've never seen before. This was built by a man who can actually do what magicians pretend to do. Real magic. I know what you really are. How does he do it? You want the truth. Nothing is impossible. I'll break it down, bro. No more secrets. Secrets are my life. Okay, so, Father, you draw some interesting parallels 
from this movie to the older film Magician by director Inger Bergman. Can you comment on that a little bit before we go forward? It's very interesting. <clears throat> there are two backgrounds I think worth uh, commenting on here. There's an old play by G.K. Chesterton, 1913, called Magic. Yes. And in the play, there is magic. And the magic is introduced into the play, a real magic act, introduced into the, into the play so that the skeptic mm -hmm. is confronted with something he can't explain. Now, when you come to prestige, see, I, I think both it and a, another very similar movie called The Illusionist, yes. they're, they're contemporary films, and they're really not about magic anymore. The, uh, the Illusionist is really a fairy tale, Romeo and Juliet. And The Prestige, it's really concerned with justice. Yes. And a sort of revenge. Revenge and justice. That actions have consequences. Okay. And it's the rivalry between two, two very talented musicians a hundred years ago in London. One uh, has a, a, an act that is uh, extremely attractive and Mesmerizing. Um, yes, that's right. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> yes. I guess you would say. He disappears from one side of the stage and yeah. immediately he reappears in the other, yeah. the transported man. And his rival is obsessed with this. How can he How do it? How can he do that? Yeah. It's not, he thinks it's not a double. He must have some way of transporting himself. So then what Christian or Catholic themes can we pull from that? Well, I think actions have consequences. Okay. You think, the, the Pope talks a lot about mercy, and we have to realize that yeah. God's act of mercy is a, stu is a miracle. It's yes. a stupendous fact. Every sin, even a minor sin, has consequences that go beyond anything we can possibly do. Someone makes a pornographic film, for example, or yes. commits a murder or a robbery. The effects of that Ripples ripple out in a way that yeah. he can't, however Understand. severe his yeah. repentance, he cannot compensate for it. He can undo the damage. That's right, he can yeah. do the damage. So mercy is a miracle. God's mercy is a miracle. And in this film, we find <laughs> there is no mercy, in fact. Yeah. That the, but we are called upon to recognize that the evil actions of this man, in fact, they're both evil. <laughs> yes. But the evil the actions have degrees, consequences. Yeah. But his, con his actions have consequences. Yeah. And the moral order is relentless. C.S. Lewis makes that point in, in his book on mere Christianity. Yes. If the physical laws of the universe are relentless, we can expect equally that the moral laws will be equally relentless. Yes. And therefore, God's mercy is a miracle, a miracle that we cannot demand. But if we receive it, we should be immensely should grateful. Be thankful for it. Yes, yes. yes. So well. by, by implication, I think, in, uh, rather than by direct and statement. Rather than as direct as the other films that yes, we spoke about right. today. It's kind of, you have to really dig mm -hmm. and search for the... Uh, but, we, but it drives from the fact we need that mercy. Yes. Without it, we're lost. We're lost, yeah. yeah. So finally now, let's talk really quickly about the end purpose of the book. What, what message, or is there a message that you're trying to bring across to the readers of this book? Yeah. Well, I think, as I, as I mentioned earlier, Films are basically our folklore, and therefore they're going to pick up the ancient themes. Uh -huh. uh, the fairy tales, for example. The miller's third son, everyone despised, will finally overcome yeah. every difficulty by his ingenuity and marry the princess. <laughs> the, uh, Cinderella will be recognized for who she for really who she is. is. rather than how she looks. That's right. Yes. The, uh, the, the themes of heroism, mm -hmm. uh, a threat will be overcome by a hero who will be rewarded by the love of some a, a woman or something, yeah. The, the rough edges of the, um, <laughs> the savage male yeah. can be refined by marriage and courtship. Yes. All of these, things, these perennial themes come back again and again and again. Well, Father, I want to thank you so much. We're running out of time for today's episode. Your insight was profound. Your book is absolutely fantastic. Where can our viewers get this? It's available um, at, from Justin Press on the internet right. and also in Toronto at... Um, Book City and Danforth. Well, thank you so much for coming today. It's uh, much appreciated, and thank you for sharing your, uh, your insights. Oh, a pleasure for okay. me. And that is all that we have time for today. I'm Noel Local. Thank you for watching Catholic Focus.